Weather, and I'm Jim Inkster, and thank you for joining us again for show number 29. The governor has done this for well over two years consecutively every month, and this is the third Wednesday, and here he is again, and again, your number is 877-217-5757. J.C. Kane and Matt Doyle are producing, and we will uh, go to the phone lines in short order with Governor John Bell Edwards, who, of course, has had a busy month. They're all busy, aren't they? They are all busy, uh, but it's it's a good kind of busy. You know, we got the biggest things off our to-do list in the most recently concluded special session where we were able to achieve the predictability, stability we needed in our revenue. We got a responsible budget going forward. And from last fiscal year to this one, basically the difference between June 30th to July 1st, we were actually able to reduce the tax burden on the people of Louisiana by more than $550 million. So. We, we are in a much better place, but, but uh, the to-do list is still long, and it's significant, and we stay busy. Um, but, you know, Jim, I enjoy every single day being governor. Now, not everything is fun, and certainly we have more challenges sometimes than I think we ought or that I would like. But, uh, but at the end of the day, I'm very thankful to, to have the, the privilege of serving the people of Louisiana. And I, and I know Donna feels the same way as First Lady. Two years ago at this time, you were dealing right at this moment with a historic flood. Uh, it, yeah. it changed the landscape and in some ways changed the culture of our state. Yeah, and, and it was so different than anything we had experienced before because this was not a named storm. So this was not a hurricane that we tracked across the Atlantic and into the Gulf. It was, it was just uh, an afternoon thunderstorm that was really not forecasted at all, but it turned out to be more than an afternoon. It lasted a couple of days and dropped... Uh, well over uh, two feet of rain in some areas, uh, and 56 out of 64 parishes were declared major federal disasters in 2016. And, you know, we, we've reached the t- second year anniversary. We're in a relatively good place, and I say that fully mindful uh, that there are still some folks out there who, who are struggling to, to fully recover, especially because of the duplication of benefits issue. If you had a homeowner who... Um, who uh, applied for and was approved for a small business administration loan, that is deemed to be a duplication of benefits that precludes someone from getting a um, grant through the Community Development Block Grant Program. And, and so we're, we're working through that. But, but by every relevant metric, um, the disaster recovery program for homeowners following the 2016 floods has been delivered faster uh, and, quite frankly, better than any similar program in our country's history. And that's not just my word. I mean, that's that's mm-hmm. what folks at HUD say. When you look at the milestones and, and how fast money was able to get out and how many stone homes have been inspected, you know, we've got $438 million worth of grant awards that we've already made, for example. So, um, and the, but what I really celebrate are the people here. I had a meeting today with a bunch of pastors and I thank them because it's the faith-based community uh, does a tremendous job, and people in Louisiana um, are, are accustomed to being neighborly to one another uh, in times of, of need and disaster, and the resilience of the people of Louisiana is truly extraordinary. Was uh, all the money used? Uh, there have been reports yeah. this week that some of it will be not used. What, what's, the, what's the case? Well, no, we don't know yet. Um, the reason is we are we're working feverishly and have been since the very first days in the Obama administration and now with the Trump administration uh, to try to get HUD to change its interpretation of the Stafford Act with respect to that duplication of benefits issue I just spoke about uh, with the Small Business Administration loan. And if either we are successful because they change their interpretation or because Congress changes the law uh, and we get the relief we seek, then we're going to have thousands of homeowners who become eligible uh, for these grants that mm-hmm. today are not eligible. So, so right now, um, you know, we're, we're going to spend all the money one way or the other. The question is whether we're going to be able to include those homeowners, and we really want to. Uh, we do have enough funding on hand so that even after we increased our reimbursement claims, for example, uh, so, so we were reimbursing uh, most homeowners at 50%. HUD approved us going to 100% reimbursement, and by the way, within two weeks, we were able to get out um, a number of checks, I, I think about $60 million um, in checks. In fact, it has been uh, as of August 16th. But even with that uh, and, and the $110 million more that, that we will uh, be able to give to homeowners uh, going forward because of that 100% reimbursement, 
we have enough funds on hand to take care of homeowners who would qualify but for that duplication mm -hmm. of benefits problem. And so we're going to work through the rest of the year and try to get uh, the relief that those homeowners need. Uh, and certainly if we do, then then we will accommodate those homeowners and, and, and spend an awful lot of that money, which would be a good thing. Again, 877-217-5757. If you get a busy signal, please be patient. Lines should open up as we move along uh, this afternoon with Governor John Bell Edwards. And we would like to cover uh, a number of topics, so uh, we intend to limit questions to a topic to one per caller. So here we go. Rich and Hammond. Rich, you're on talk or you're <laughs> you're on Ask the Governor with Governor John Bell Edwards. Hi Rich. Hey, how are you, sir? Fine. Hi Rich. Uh pleasure talking to you. Uh quick question for you. I'm a transplant to Louisiana and the whole time it seems like I've been down here uh, the state has been fighting with the budget. And I know one revenue source that other states use is license plate fees. And where I come from, they're $100 a year to renew your license plate. Why do we only charge $10 a year down here? Well, Rich, first of all, thank you for the call. And, and look, no, no two states uh, have taxes and fees that are, that are like alike. And so every, every state does things differently. Uh, but I will tell you that uh, it did take a little bit too long uh, for us to get the, the revenue situation ironed out here in Louisiana. Um, but we, we do have the predictability, the stability that we need now going forward. Um, and, and I believe that, that the amount of revenue we have come in will be uh, able, will enable us, I should say, to fashion responsible budgets. Uh, and, and so we're, we're going to be stable moving forward. I, I believe based on the information that I have, about employment and uh, economic development, investment, and that sort of thing, that our economy is going to continue to improve, and we're going to uh, do better on, on revenue as a result of growth. Um, so we won't be looking to go up on any fees related to uh, automobiles and, and, and license plates. Uh, but, but I do appreciate the call, and, and I, I would just uh, uh, suggest that no two states uh, enact the same taxes and fees. Uh, all states are, are different. Good afternoon, Amanda. You're on Ask the Governor. Amanda, you Hi, are... Governor Edwards. There you go. Hi, Amanda. Hi, Thank you for Edwards. being with us today. Hi. Thank you for taking my question. Um, my question is in reference to the remaining Restore Grant Funds, which I believe total around $680 or so million. Uh, Restore's Action Plan Amendment 9 was originally submitted to HUD on July 18th with a notation that the state may hold the balance of remaining funds until Congress and HUD issues updates regarding SBA loans and duplication of benefits in anticipation of the various pieces of legislation going through Congress. And two days later, on July 20th, Restore withdrew that version and resubmitted a replacement APA that completely omitted that notation. All right. Well, Amanda, thank you for the call. And... Uh, what I, what I can tell you, and this gets back to what Jim asked me earlier, uh, the, the most recent action plan amendment that we submitted to HUD uh, came after the Restore Task Force voted unanimously to accept my recommendation to move from a 50% reimbursement to homeowners for those who were eligible up to 100%. Uh, since, since that happened, uh, I know that more than $60 million over the last couple of weeks, a couple of three weeks, uh, have actually gone out the door uh, to homeowners in order to increase that reimbursement. Overall, uh, because of that change, there will be $110 million additional um, relief for those homeowners on the reimbursement uh, side of the program. Uh, and, and I can tell you that there will be a balance left over. Uh, how we use the balance, we won't know until we know for sure whether or not we get the relief that we're seeking on the duplication of benefits prohibition. Uh, that currently is is taking homeowners, thousands of homeowners who would otherwise be eligible for Restore grants and making them ineligible because they received Small Business Administration loans or in some cases they were approved for loans and, and took portion of what they were approved for or maybe not at all. And so we're working through that. Um, and, and so when we talk about a balance today, um, we there, there are multiple contingencies in place as or how we are going to spend that balance. What we want is the relief uh, that we can get either through HUD changing their interpretation 
of the Stafford Act to remove that barrier, that duplication of benefits barrier, or a change in law, and I know our congressional delegation uh, is working hard to make that happen, uh, and we're closely watching a bill that passed the House. It's in the Senate now, and we'd like for it to pass because it would give the flexibility to HUD and to the President to grant the relief that we seek. Thank you, Amanda. James in Longview, Texas. James, good afternoon. You're on Ask the Governor with Governor Edwards. Well, good afternoon, Jim, and good afternoon, Governor Edwards. Hey, James, good to hear from you again. Good to hear you. Anyhow, basically, I just want to ask you about your recent meeting a few days ago with President Trump and other governors about overhauling a correction system. And my question is very simple. Was there anything uh, you and the president actually agreed on that might help Louisiana corrections? I heard Nebraska just used the fentanyl to ex execute a patient, uh, well, a prisoner, rather, for the first time ever in the United States yesterday. And I just didn't know if you had any views on that. Did you? Well, James, thank you very much for the call. First of all, I appreciate the invitation that I got from President Trump to join four other governors, and they were the governors of Kentucky and um, South, uh, North Dakota uh, and Georgia and, uh, let's see, uh, and the attorney generals of Texas and, and Florida as well. Uh, but, but we were able to, to get uh, together with the president, talk about, about criminal justice reform, and it was also good to have Secretary Perry there because he was the governor of Texas when about 10 years ago uh, they moved forward on criminal justice reform that looks a lot like what we have done in Louisiana. Uh, and it reaffirmed uh, what I already believed uh, based on all of the information we had at our disposal as we studied our system and we looked at what other states had done, and that is that Louisiana is on a much better track now uh, to improve public safety, to lower recidivism, lower the crime rate, but actually save money through a lower incarceration rate that we will reinvest 70% of the, of the savings into the system. And by the way, one of the most exciting things is last Friday, uh, the Joint Legislative Committee on the Budget uh, recognized a specific amount of savings from the first year, and we did reinvest 70% of the savings into the reentry program, into uh, education and training opportunities for folks who are behind bars uh, to make sure that they're successful. Uh, into things like alternative to, pris uh, to prison to begin with, uh, with drug courts and, and other um, uh, programs of that sort. So we're, we're excited about what we're doing uh, to be able to have the president embrace and endorse what we are, the approach that we're taking. And really the purpose was to, to assemble governors who've done criminal justice reform to meet with the president and go over a uh, House of Representatives bill that is passed and that is pending in Congress, uh, I'm sorry, sh I should say pending in the Senate, to see what parts of that uh, bill that we agreed with, which ones we didn't, and if there were any things not in the bill that we thought should be. Uh, and it was a two-hour meeting, which lasted an hour longer than it was supposed to. Um, and, and the president and his team uh, were sincere. They, they really wanted the, the feedback and the input. Uh, and we had a very good, frank uh, exchange. And, and so I appreciated the fact that, that he invited me and that I was able to visit with all of the folks that worked for him, but also these other governors uh, and the Attorney General from Florida and Texas. 877-217-5757. You've invited the President of the United States to tour Angola with you. Have you received a response? We have not received a response to the invitation. We've received communication from the White House that acknowledging the receipt of the invitation and, and that they expressed an interest in coming, but, but obviously he's got to see whether um, he... Uh, can do it or when he can do it and, and that sort of thing. But specifically, I wanted him to go to Angola uh, to look at things we're doing uh, around reentry. Uh, we have education and training programs there that are some of the best in the country uh, as it relates to welding, horticulture, um, to have ASC certified mechanics, for example, mm -hmm. uh, that come out of prison, uh, many of them with job offers before they ever leave. Uh, and it is a successful program, and, and because of his focus on reentry, we wanted him to see that. We also wanted him to see, and the nation to see, that Angola is a very different place than it was 20, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, the, and reputations are a hard thing to shake, um, but we have a lot of good things happening there. Um, certainly it's not perfect. I don't think any correction system or institution uh, is perfect. But if you could look at the role, for example, that the New Orleans Baptist Theological seminary plays uh, in offering degree programs 
uh, and having mentors and, and mentees throughout that, that uh, program. I'll tell you, Warden Daryl Vinoy and his staff there are doing a great job, and we wanted to share that with the president and, and get his um, – uh, just make sure that he understands how important reentry is, uh, and he can do that at the federal level, mm -hmm. but they also may be able to make some money available uh, through grants and other programs to the states to actually accelerate uh, and grow our reentry program. Now, some of your uh, political foes have um, tried to paint you as being soft on crime and have pointed the criminal justice reform, uh, uh, and you have some conservatives, many conservatives, who are in your camp on that. And also we had the uh, non-unanimous unanimous jury uh, bill passed, yes. the legislature, going to the vote of the people. Uh, you're supportive of this, I, I believe. I am. And if you look at the uh, way that, that that was created, it was at a constitutional convention uh, for the state of Louisiana in the late 1800s. And the express purpose behind uh, the non-unanimous jury provision uh, has to do with the um, – preservation of white supremacy in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. uh, and the founding fathers of our country, when they guaranteed a trial by jury, uh, what they contemplated, and, and just about every scholar acknowledges this, was a unanimous jury because it was the only type of jury known then. Um, and so we need to get back to the founding fathers. We are the only state in the nation that allows a murder conviction by a non-unanimous jury. Only one other state, it's Oregon, Oregon. allows for a non-unanimous jury of a felony other than murder. So we are clearly out of the mainstream, and, and I think we ought to uh, uh, get rid of that vestige of Jim Crow uh, and, and do what other states have done. And, and, and so I'm, I'm hopeful that that will pass. I thank J.P. Morrell because as senator, he's the one that brought the instrument. And by the way, it looked, you know, we have religious organizations. We have uh, good government groups. We've got, I think, the state Republican Party. Uh, have endorsed that constitutional mm -hmm. amendment, so hopefully it will pass. And on criminal justice in a, in a broader context, the coalition of interest groups, stakeholders who came together to embrace and to support that, every single bill we passed that I signed in law was supported by the district attorneys, for example. But we had Grover Norquist's group. We had the Koch brothers. We mm -hmm. had uh, Louisiana Association of Business and Industry. Uh, we had the Pelican Institute, but we also had the ACLU. We had the religious right, the religious left. You, you name it, we had a huge group of people that came together. And the reason is we based it on data, uh, objective data, and, and best practices from other states, things that had been done and proven successful. And so we didn't do anything new uh, in Louisiana. And it's unfortunate because some of the folks who are uh, out there attacking me um, by way of criminal justice reform are really not uh, presenting facts uh, and they are conflating things that are not the same uh, and and quite frankly they talk about rearrest even under the numbers that they have which we believe to be wrong we are on a uh, path to have a lower rearrest than the national average in the first year uh, so and and certainly a rearrest is not the same thing as recidivism mm -hmm. so we, we believe we're in a much better place there is no reason why the state of Louisiana should continue to have, in fact, we do not have, the nation's highest incarceration rate. Now, on, on the death penalty, I believe you've said you would follow the law, that uh, you would, if, if somebody is uh, sent a death sentence and it's time to do it and they're guilty, and based on the review, yeah. that you're in favor of that, but you've been criticized for what you may think about it. Are you willing to say how you feel about the death penalty? Well, my oath of office is the same with respect to the death penalty as to any other law or the Constitution of the state of Louisiana. And, and it uses the word support. So I, I took an oath then to support, and I do support today, the laws. But the law around the death penalty uh, prescribes a very specific method by which uh, executions are to take place. It's by lethal injection with a prescribed uh, drug cocktail. And quite simply put, uh, those drugs are not available to the state of Louisiana. Uh, they haven't been for some time, and we do not have uh, a way to carry out uh, executions. That has been the case for a long time. In fact, I think there's been exactly one execution since 2002. Uh, and uh, the, the Under several governors, obviously. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, and so, you know, 
I will tell you now, uh, because I know the Attorney General likes to talk about this, I am not going to go back to methods of execution that have been discarded by Louisiana because society believes them to be cruel and inhumane. Things like uh, firing squads and electrocutions and 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 so forth. I and mean, we're just we're just not going to do those things. Um, and and I, I believe that the people of Louisiana are squarely on my side there. But you know I'm I'm comfortable uh, with, with my position that we are not going to do those things. Eight seven seven two one seven five seven five seven. Tom and Kentwood, please be brief. Tom, you're on with Governor John Bell Edwards. Uh, good afternoon, Governor. How are you doing? Hey, Tom, doing fine. Thank you. I have a question for you, sir, and it's somewhat of the sacred cow type question. Right. As you know, in Louisiana, many retirees enjoy a benefit called drop. If they serve their full pension, they can work another three years, and they really, in essence, get double pay for the last three years. To me, as a taxpayer, that seems super counterproductive, and I've heard a lot of the logic. If it keeps talent in the system, well, when you're, tired to, when you're ready to retire, you retire and you go hire younger people. All right. We will get the governor to respond to your question. And, 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 and Tom, before you hang up, uh, get with Micah. Make sure he gets your name and number uh, so that right. in the event that we need to get back with you, we'll be able to do that as well. Governor John Bell Edwards, before we went to the break, was asked by Tom in Kentwood, a town the governor knows pretty well, uh, about the drop program. Uh, he didn't particularly like it. Yeah, that that's, was my understanding. And, and, Tom, I apologize that we had to go to break before I could get to your question. What I can tell you is we have not, um, since I've been governor, made any changes to the drop program. We haven't expanded. We haven't uh, curtailed it. Uh, I do believe that the uh, purpose behind drop is to allow people to retire uh, but for uh, critical personnel uh, that, that we be allowed uh, to have the benefit of their employment so that we don't go without folks with their expertise where, where it's needed. Um, and that drop program, I believe, is available uh, through the school uh, retirement system and also through the state retirement system and, 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 and probably all of the, the various retirement systems that we're talking about. Uh, and it, as I understand it, uh, drop is not supposed to have an adverse uh, impact upon, for example, the unfunded accrued liability that we have in our in our pension systems. Uh, but I will I will look specifically at this, and 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 we'll get uh, somebody back in touch with you. So so first of all, I can make sure they understand the exact nature of your objection or your concern, and see if we can address that. There was a report a few days ago, Governor, about uh, you repeating a call for officers in every school. Yeah. Why, why do you believe this would be a good idea? Well, because we've seen examples around the country where school resource officers who are properly trained and equipped uh, and on hand are, are making a real difference in promoting uh, school safety. And there, there's no higher priority uh, for any government than the safety of its people, but that's especially true with respect to school children and, and children. Uh, and so I believe school resource officers are a key ingredient to this. Um, I do not favor, as you, I think, know, the arming of school teachers. Uh, we're not going to do that in Louisiana. Uh, but I do believe it's appropriate to have school resource officers. I also believe it's appropriate that they be properly utilized. So they shouldn't be presiding over the detention class, for example. Uh, they ought to be uh, positioned where they need to be to control ingress and egress, egress and look at uh, specific dangers that might materialize. Uh, and not be used as disciplinarians at the school. And, and I think schools are getting away from that, uh, by the way, which is a good thing. Um, by the way, I think it's it's healthy for us and, and for society in general that interactions between children and, and police officers be positive. And so we, we wouldn't want the police officer on a campus to be the disciplinarian anyway because we want children as they grow up to feel mm -hmm. good about their police officers and want to work with them and, and, and so forth. And uh, so... I think it's important. It's a it's a huge it's a huge part of school safety across the state of Louisiana. And one of the things we were doing was inventorying every school mm -hmm. in the state, starting at the high schools, to figure out uh, what problems we saw. Whether it was the school resource officer, whether it was too many points of ingress and egress, uh, no fence, uh, inadequate locks on the doors. And so we we've been making an aggressive effort throughout the summer to do that. We've had a lot of success, and we've had school superintendents complete surveys and turn them back in, and, and we are going to refine our action plan going forward based on that information. Emily in New Orleans. Good afternoon, Emily. You're on with Governor John Bell Edwards. 
Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for taking my call. Hi, Emily. Hi. So my question uh, pertains to the solar industry and solar panels. I'm, I understand the reason for uh, canceling the solar tax credit in the first place, but given how beneficial it can be to uh, individual um, energy bill payers and uh, the environment, and given the fact that nationwide the solar industry employs far more people than the fossil fuel industry, I'm wondering if there are any plans to bring it back either the uh, solar panel tax credit or to otherwise make solar panels uh, more accessible and attractive to individual residents and to utilities. Thank you, Emily. And and I do know that solar panels are becoming both cheaper and more efficient in the way that they operate. Uh, There are other benefits uh, besides uh, the state tax credits, which have been uh, rescinded, as you know. Uh, we did have a problem, by the way, a few years ago in the way that we did that because we cut out the tax credit program and there were more credits that had been issued and certified, uh, and we had to come back and appropriate some money in order to properly retire those. I will tell you, Emily, that uh, the, the solar industry continues to grow around the country and I believe in the state of Louisiana without the state tax credit. I have not been approached by anyone, uh, as best I can recall, uh, before your call today about reinstating some part uh, or some program related to solar tax credits, uh, we really are trying to make sure that we get tax expenditures in order because they are a big part of the reason uh, why why we were unable uh, to maintain critical investments in, in many of our, our priorities with respect to our budget. Uh, so at this time, I can tell you, I don't have any, uh, I, any idea about or... or you know, plans, to, I guess I should say, uh, to uh, to reinstate a solar p- panel tax credit. Uh, but obviously, I'm, I'm open to uh, to having a conversation about that with, with any legislator or other stakeholder who, who thinks it would be a good thing to do. 877-217-5757 for Governor John Bell Edwards. And uh, one of the new budget wrinkles is the prospect of getting some state uh, money from internet sales uh how will that be it's a morass according to some uh, how will that be implemented actually it's 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 fairly simple and straightforward uh because when it comes to uh retailers uh, who are remote dealers under the louisiana law which is the same by the way as south dakota and that was on purpose uh, because when South Dakota won, we want to be able to take advantage of this. Uh, we are going to allow them uh, to move forward by collecting and remitting sales taxes and paying those sales taxes to only one uh, entity in Louisiana. Uh, and that entity in Louisiana would separate out the state portion and then send the local portion uh, to the local taxing jurisdiction according to the zip code. Uh, and we, we made sure that, uh, that we're not being retroactive about this, uh, and meaning that, that, that it's only the taxes from that date uh, going forward. Uh, and we're making it very easy uh, for compliance. Uh, and we are indemnifying those people who collect and remit to the uh, entity that is prescribed in state law. Uh, now, this is going to be a beneficial impact to the state, but also, and, and, and this is really the most important thing to me, to bricks and mortar retailers in Louisiana who, who have been put at an unfair disadvantage relative to out-of-state retailers uh, who were not collecting and remitting the tax and therefore getting a 9 or a 10 percent uh, advantage uh, over the cost of their products. Uh, and so this should level the playing field. I think it's going to be a good thing uh, for businesses in Louisiana. And, and there should be some additional revenue to the state. I will tell you, we uh, the Revenue Estimating Conference has not yet put a number on it. I'm, the economists who works for the legislature and the economist who works for the division administration, uh, they, they've been looking at this, uh, and maybe at some future REC meeting they will put a number on it. We, we, we know it's going to be positive. We won't, it won't go backwards. But exactly how much additional revenue uh, this is going to bring in, they don't yet know. 877-217-5757 is your number, and Governor John Bell Edwards is here for almost another 20 minutes if you'd like to get in under the wire and ask him a question. And he's done this 29 times now, and uh, he's the first governor since Mike Foster to uh, have a monthly program in Louisiana, and we appreciate him doing this every month dutifully. And he is a busy man with, uh, with a few uh, 
hobbies. He has a family, um, <laughs> some some children that you still have to tend to on a regular basis, and and of course uh, a beautiful first lady who has many passions of her own. How have you liked? Uh, living in the mansion you had to move out at one point but uh well we did we spent a couple of months out after august of 16 uh because the flood got us too uh at the governor's mansion but it's a great privilege to to live there and and obviously it's a beautiful uh home uh to live in and uh we we feel very very blessed to be there Uh, and we like to entertain we like to open the doors because after all while we live there we know it's not our house um, you know, so for this evening, for example, we're going to have a reception honoring um, the Louisiana Department of Economic Development for the ninth straight mm-hmm. year. They've got a national award-winning best uh, workforce development program in the country called Fast Start. And the Committee of 100 is going to celebrate by sponsoring a reception. And so we'll have a couple hundred people there uh, tonight. And, and we do that several times every week to open the doors and, and bring people into the governor's mansion so that so that we can celebrate with them and they can see uh, what the mansion looks like and we really enjoy that and in a couple of weeks you'll be heading for dallas for a uh, will. football affair i'm excited you know this time of year and i guess i'm 50 i'll be 52 next month and uh, but ever since i was a small child this time of year i get excited mm-hmm. uh kids are back on campus uh and 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 football practice has started mm-hmm. and and i always look forward to the high school jamborees or to the opening game of college and so I'm excited about going to Dallas to uh, watch LSU uh, beat Miami and get off to a great start uh, on this football season. Well, and if uh, the Tigers lose any more quarterbacks, uh, Coach O might want to know if you have any more eligibility (laughs) remaining. Let's go to Virginia in New Orleans. Virginia, good afternoon. You're on with Governor Edwards. Hello, Governor. I appreciate you taking my call. I'm one of those residents who got the solar panels installed, oh, about um, eight weeks before they ended the credits, and I had got denied my credits, and I had to file an appeal in order, while, they, and while we waited for them to put, give us back the, the money that they had promised us, yes, and ma'am. I had to pay a $300 tax appeal fee. Then they changed the law back, and they're giving us our credit um, over a three-year period, but they won't give us back our $300 tax appeal fee. Well, I can have someone call you, Virginia. Uh, I don't, obviously, I don't know the, the details of, of your particular situation or how widespread it is. I do know that in order to rectify the problem, uh, after we ended the tax credit, it became apparent that we had not appropriated the money necessary to pay all the certified credits. And so we came back subsequently Uh, And quite frankly, I can't even remember what year we did this. I uh, want to say we we did it in in 2016 or 2017. Uh, But we appropriated the additional money in order to retire the credits. And based on your question, uh, there was a fee that you had to pay in order to keep your claim alive until it could be paid. And you wanted that fee of $300 to be paid as well. Um, I don't know the law in this area and whether whether that's something that we were obligated to pay as a matter of law or not. Uh, but if you will give your number and name to Micah, uh, I will make sure that someone uh, from the Louisiana Department of Revenue uh, gives you a call and talks to you about that. Thank you, Virginia. Maureen in New Orleans. Hello, Maureen. You're on with the governor. Hi, Governor. I was a school teacher in the public schools of Louisiana for 40 years. Yes, ma'am. And during that, during that time, I also had numerous jobs in which I paid Social Security. And for the past 13 years, I have held jobs and still pay Social Security, but do not get benefits because I was a school teacher. Now, I want to know why I have to pay Social Security when no one will give me payment for Social Security. Uh, First of all, Maureen, thank you for the call. Secondly, thank you for being an educator in in Louisiana uh, for uh, 40 years. I I don't think there is a more noble calling than that of being a school teacher. Uh, You're talking about the so-called Windfall Elimination Act uh, that is a matter of federal law. Um, many decades ago, the state of Louisiana opted out of the Social Security system, and and uh, it would require a change in federal law in order 
for the situation that you're discussing to uh, be remedied. Uh, and by the way, it's the exact same situation that my mother is in because it, it didn't just apply to school teachers. My mother was a state employee uh, all those years, and, and she worked. And, and, uh, and even though she had other jobs both before and after, uh, she, she can't collect her Social Security either. Um, and every year, uh, or I should say in every Congress, multiple bills get filed, uh, and they never move because I believe there is a huge cost to changing uh, the approach that's currently in law with, with respect to this. But Maureen, this, this is a matter of, of federal law, uh, and it, it, the implication, the only thing the state did uh, was many, many years ago, decades ago, uh, when they opted out of the Social Security system, this is the natural uh, legal consequence of that decision, and any change that would produce a benefit to you with respect to uh, Social Security would have to come uh, mm -hmm. at the federal level in Congress. I think, uh, excuse me, Superintendent John White, Education Superintendent, yes. is being evaluated today by the Bessie Board, his annual evaluation. He's had uh, uh, friction with both you and the previous governor. Uh, your thoughts about his performance? Well, look, I actually had a meeting with Superintendent White yesterday, um, along with several members of the Bessie Board and my staff, uh, because, I mean, as you mentioned, and you were very fair about that, I have had disagreements, policy disagreements with Superintendent White that go back, um, I guess now, six, seven years, um, and they're significant. Uh, but he is the state superintendent of education, uh, and we need for education in Louisiana to be improved. I want uh, student performance and school performance uh, to be uh, better than it is and we we are working with him every way that we can both on that and on enhancing school safety and he is on the task force that we appointed that blue ribbon uh, task force on school safety now obviously I don't have a role to play uh, Bessie actually does the the evaluation and I know they're going to look at a variety of things uh, uh, all of the performance indicators that you have related to districts and schools and and student performance and and things like high school graduation rates ACT scores um, the standardized test mm -hmm. scores whereby we compare student performance in Louisiana to students elsewhere but also uh, to students in Louisiana previously and and are we making gains are we, and are the gains enough to keep us competitive with other states are we catching up with other states and what is the performance gap among our poor children and, and though there are, there are way too many factors uh, involved uh, for me to say well I would give him a C or a B or, or an A or whatever I'm not going to do that here today I'm just going to tell you that so long as he's the uh, superintendent and I'm the governor uh, I'm going to work with him to to improve our schools all over the state of Louisiana and make sure that we move forward in Metairie we go Metairie brings us Mary good afternoon Mary you're on Ask the Governor. Hi, thank you so much for taking my call. Thank you, Mary. Um, I, wanted, I wanted to ask about our homeless population. There is a huge homeless population here in, uh, in New Orleans. I drive for Lyft, and I see them every day out in the elements. No, um, <laughs> no access to any decency, no, no public restrooms. It's unconscionable how we um, ha to have so many homeless people just living out on the streets in the elements. And I wanted to know, what is the state of Louisiana doing? Because I feel like we have a moral, moral obligation to take care of our own people. Um, what is the state doing? Um, thank you, Mary. Well, Mary, thank you very much for the call. And, and obviously, um, if, if you're seeing an, an uptick in the homeless population, then we're not doing everything that we should be doing in partnership with uh, New Orleans or, or other uh, local governments and, and the federal government. I can tell you that there was a very concerted effort in New Orleans with respect to veteran homelessness um, over the recent years, and, and a big uh, decrease uh, in veteran homelessness did result. Um, but based on your question, uh, if, if, if uh, what you're seeing isn't purely anecdotal, but it's actually uh, objectively true, then, then we have a growing homeless population rather than one that's shrinking. Um, and and I, I do believe that we uh, should try to do more. One of the things that we do, uh, I can tell you, is with every disaster, um, when we open up shelters, 
then what we find out at, when we try to close the shelters down, the people who are remaining typically are people who were homeless before it ever happened. And we use those opportunities to engage with them and engage with housing and urban development, look at all of the, the, uh, the housing programs that we have at our disposal to try to get them into uh, housing, affordable housing. Um, and and we, we do have some success there, but that's because we come face to face with them and we're dealing with them. Um, and, and maybe we, we need to take a new look at how we approach this uh, when we don't have a disaster and we're not dealing with folks in our shelters. Uh, and so, Mary, I'm, I'm just going to have to tell you today on this radio call that we're not doing everything that we probably should. And, and we will take a look at that and see what, what more we can do in partnership with local government and with the federal government. Now, uh, unfortunately, we won't be able to get to everyone today, but the governor will return on September 19th for show number 30. And uh, between now and then, you'll be celebrating a birthday. I recall when you ran for office the first time uh, as a state representative, you were a young lad. I think when you announced you were 40, turned 41 in that campaign, and soon you'll be 52. It's been quite a 11 or 12 years, hasn't it? Uh, it has, and but a really good time period uh, in my life, and really for our family, too, to be able to serve as a state representative for two terms, and now... Um, you know, closing out my third year uh, as governor, it's it's been a, a great time. You know, I, as a young person, I guess like most, I used to think 50 was really old. Now that I'm going to be 52, my definition of old has changed, and I'm nowhere near old. I'm I'm uh, I still think of myself as very young and uh, and so forth. But it's been a great privilege to serve the people of Louisiana. Uh, and by the way, I really enjoyed being a, a legislator. I mean, that that was a lot of fun and it was very rewarding. But uh, the best job in the state of Louisiana is still being governor. Uh, and, and I'm very, very thankful for the opportunity. Well, uh, you got there in a hurry. It was, it was uh, what, eight years from the time you were elected to the House to being elected governor. Yeah. That usually doesn't happen. No, and, and look, we, we worked really, really hard. And the people of Louisiana embraced uh, me and Donna and, our, and the candidacy. And, and uh, it, you know, it worked. But, but and some people say, oh, you got lucky. But isn't it, isn't it true that luck typically f follows those who work really, really hard as well? Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, we're, we're putting that same work ethic, uh, um, you know, into actually serving as governor I as well. And next year is an election year. It's hard to believe uh, that, that we're at that point in the term. But, uh, but I look forward to, to running for re-election and beating people because I think we'll easily be able to demonstrate to the satisfaction of the people of Louisiana that the state is much better off at the end of my first term than it was uh, at the beginning. Well, we'll see you next month. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Governor John Bell Edwards.